Hello and welcome to this edition of TZM Global Radio. I'm your host for today, James Phillips from the UK chapter of the Zeitgeist Movement and TZM Education. And uh, I'm on a motherfucking boat. Uh, Yes, that's right. I am actually on a boat (laughs) recording this radio show. Thus, the uh, rather explicit and wonderful introduction um, to this week's radio show. And the reason that I am on a boat is because I live on a boat. This would explain my absence from the airwaves of TZM Global in recent times. My life has uh, been on a long transitionary journey for quite some time towards this way of life. A way of life that has the Zeitgeist movement mainly to thank for it. As the shift that has happened in my values was not of the sort that could maintain my previous relationship's extensionality. So I now live on board this boat, having um, got rid of the mortgage, the 35-year noose round my neck given to me by the bank that never had the money to lend to me in the first place. Um, (laughs) And now I live rent and mortgage free and I don't pay any council tax and I'm nearly at the stage where I'm not going to be paying any tax to the government. I don't pay any tax on my fuel. And I am lucky enough along my journeys to have picked up a shipmate in the shape of my new girlfriend who I met through the Zeitgeist movement. So who would have known it, eh? A uh, movement that advocates the scientific method for social concerns somehow managed to wind up being a dating site. Thank you, TZM. So uh, it is it is an amazing thing to have a, a relationship, I must say, with someone who really shares your values, who's extensional um, to you, and who is on the same page. It does make a a big difference in my book. That's not to say that if you're in a relationship where the other person doesn't necessarily share your views about the natural law resource-based economy that you should just jump ship. Um, No pun intended. Maybe you share other extensionality and you can overlook that particular area. I, I can't speak for other people. All I can do is speak for myself and say that it wasn't enough in my previous relationship but it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom Um, one door closes and another one opens so to speak I think um, divorce is often spoke of as a very negative thing but if you think about it logically it was definitely good for one person and if they didn't want to be with the other one then the other one should be pleased that they're not with them anymore speaking logically of course and by now you might be wondering why I'm even babbling on about this stuff Um, in terms of personal relationships and all this kind of business. It's not something that we usually discuss in the movement, but I think it's um, central, one of the central reasons anyway for me, why we advocate what we advocate. Because with the price system, you never really know what someone really wants. And I, I use this one in an approach to talk about what we talk about with people now when I say to them, so what's your opinion of employment and work? Do you think that work is, is a good thing? You know, working for a living, that is? And most people say, yeah, sure. And I say, so what would you do if you won the lottery? And they say, I'd give up work. <laughs> well, pardon me, but you only believe in work up to the point where you actually have to earn money. So what about if we took money out of the equation and it weren't any issue? Well, the whole rules of the game shift. And I use that approach a couple of times with people just to illuminate the fact that you you hold these beliefs almost because you have to, because that's the dominant culture set. Whereas I say to people, I think unemployment is, in a sane economic system, a fantastic move because it means you're probably doing more with less, um, that people aren't doing dangerous, monotonous, or laborious tasks that they would otherwise not choose to do. And it means that you're essentially producing more abundance and society's getting healthier because you're not having people forced to do stuff that they don't want to do. These are all congruent to what we talk about, I feel, because the point of having a um, access abundance that is to not hoard and own as much of this planet as you possibly can before you turn up your toes and die, is is that it creates a completely different social paradigm and completely different personal relationships. And that is a really, really key point. 
how many people are out there are stuck in a relationship that either they don't want to be in or the other person feels forced to be in because they are too dependent on each other that doesn't sound like a particularly healthy premise to have a relationship by, or on to me um, I think that the two of you should be able to stand on your own two feet and then when you come together you have something to offer each other if you can resolve your differences then great and if you can't move on amicably if at all possible and that's kind of the point isn't it if at all possible is it at all possible to do so in our system not for an awful lot of people because if you're both needing to work to earn enough money in your family home and you would like to break up amicably and one of you doesn't have enough money then it might just end up that one of you ends up sleeping in the spare room which is not an ideal situation to bring up children in not that capitalism is the ideal situation for family uh, anyway at least in my opinion the father goes out all day to earn money at his place of employment the kids go off and they are put into peer groups away from the family uh, their close family units only to see each other again in the uh, the final hours of the evening before bed Human society didn't really originate that way. We spent the majority of our evolutionary history as being nomadic. In our close family tribal groups and units, surrounded not just by those of our own age, but our grandparents and our mothers and our fathers. And It seems to me that that is the uh, optimal way in which we would want to bring up children and actually live a life on this planet, moving from place to place. If you want to settle down, then settle down but essentially I think an, a, a world of access abundance where you're not actually penned in by the protectionist standpoint of having to own things in a price system and a monetary sense is a fantastic liberation and one that myself and my girlfriend have fully embraced by the life that we are now living on the canal system in the UK which um, I'm going to turn my attention to now and discuss a little bit with a little bit of background into how I sort of emerged into the idea of living on a boat. There was a few forks in the road. I used to go running on the towpath near the boats and always thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to just move from place to place and see the whole world as your garden? At that particular point, I'd look out of my window at my garden and all I'd see is a prison yard that I was allowed to exercise in. <laughs> um a running joke of mine is to say, oh yes, I've owned property everywhere. I've owned property in Rickmansworth, Berkhamsted. I've even owned property at the Grove, which was good enough for the Bilderberg Group, so therefore it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, you know, you've got to have a little fun with these things, folks. You know, that's an important thing to just mention as a side note. Uh, yeah, the world's shit at the moment, but it's always been shit in some regard try to do this with a spring in your step and have a little bit of fun with it you do only get one life and it's quite nice to smile in it as much as possible um which the canal is really helping me to do it's not for everyone if you have a particularly nervous disposition then days like where you have to go on a 10 lock journey to get your water um, because you had the audacity of taking a shower every day so that you ran out of the 600 litres of water that you have on your boat in just under 10 days. And then doing that journey, um, uh, needing to reverse your 60 foot by 10 wide beam by pushing a great big pole, a wooden pole into the canal to try to steer it back to the other lock to only just about turn around, go down, smash a window on a tree, and then it start hailstoning, might put a shitter on some people's day. But if you just have a laugh about these things, it's uh, it's quite good fun to get through. And certainly worth it when you, you have the sun beaming down on you and driving your canal boat around the, the system. Living on next to no money, um, it costs about less than five grand a year. To live this way of life, it's far more um, environmentally friendly, especially if you don't burn coal and you have solar panels on your roof and things like that. You're off the grid. You're as out of the system, as far as I'm concerned, as you can hope to get, which is, is very good. And you, you find that a lot of people down here in the canal life 
have extremely similar values to the values that the movement advocate uh, that is. And it's very easy to communicate our message to people who live on the water because you soon understand if you live this particular kind of life w the benefits it has to your health um, are, and how dramatic those benefits are in terms of the uh, getting away from the keeping up with the Joneses mentality. There's a lot of people down here on the canals that are here for that reason. They were sick to death of working the monotonous nine to five to pay over inflated rent and mortgages and um, chose the nomadic lifestyle of the canals instead. But as I was saying, it's not for everyone. If you like your toasters and your big widescreen TV and washing machines um, and such things and, and uh, standing in your shower for 10 minutes whilst the water beats down on you because it just feels very nice to do, then this lifestyle isn't for you. However, you can think that you can't go without an awful lot of things until you go without them. Um, for instance, a shower every day. Oh, you mean you don't have a shower every day? You must be really dirty. Actually, you're dirty when you tend to start to smell. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have a shower every day. Yeah, maybe I have a shower once every two, once every three days. So what? It doesn't really make that big a difference. And you have to stop caring what people think of you a lot as well. You know, when I tell people that, they go, Oh, you smelly bastard. And I just think to myself, well, pfft, I'm a smelly bastard who works three days a week. W what about you? Oh, I work five days a week at my shitty job. Well, I'd rather be smelly and free than a clean slave. Because <laughs> uh, I just know how to win people over with my charm and non-violent communication skills. Um... <laughs> Uh, all of this is said in jest, of course, so I hope you all realise. And whilst on the topic of personal hygiene, moving into the field of sanitation, which is a very common topic amongst boaters, uh, as I'm sure you can probably imagine, trying to sell boating life on the aspect of needing to pump your shit out of your boat for 20 minutes into a sanitation point here on the canal is probably not a selling point for most and I can't say I particularly enjoy it but you know it does bring you into contact with your resource management um, program so to speak and uh, the rule here on the canal is uh, if it's yellow let it mellow if it's brown flush it down <laughs> and another aspect of uh, living on board a canal is the delayed gratification that comes with it. Yeah, in the winter it's really freezing when you get on board a canal boat. So you've got to get there, you've got to stoke up your fire, and you've got to wait for the warmth to come to you. You know, and then when you finally got your boat nice and toasty, that cup of tea you have after that boat is toasty is the best fucking cup of tea you've ever had in your life. And the same goes for everything else, really, about living on the water. If you want to get warm in the first place, then you need to spend a couple of hours foraging for some wood and uh, cutting it up on your boat and what have you. In fact, that's a good, good point to mention as well. Some of the assumptions that people make about this way of life are hilarious, um, such as one person actually said to me, well, where are you going to get your logs from? They cost a lot of money. I... I I was just stunned for words. I was like, well, you know all of that woodland. <laughs> um, if you walk out in there, there does tend to be a bit of wood, uh, as well as other things. It was fascinating. During the uh, flooding here in the UK, the amount of people who actually said, are you okay on your boat? What? In the flood? Noah built an ark. <laughs> okay, I'm fine on my boat. You people have the problem because you live on the land. Yes, I'm fine. That being said, actually, uh, you're not completely fine in a flood of that sort of magnitude because your mooring pins that you tonk into the um, towpath to keep your boat moored will come loose and uh, your boat will float into the middle of the canal if there's a storm, which is always amusing to come home to find your boat in the middle. I haven't actually found it fully in the middle yet. One end is always tied up, so I haven't had to go on swimming in the canal, uh, something I have done previously to save a drunk man from the canal a few years ago, something I wouldn't recommend. 
so as I was saying, there was some forks in the road um, that brought me to this way of life, and that was not one of them, swimming in the canal, I have to say, but it didn't put me off. And the, these various forks really came to a head when I was on board a friend's boat, and I met um, a chap there who I hadn't known before that day, and I was saying how much I would like that sort of life. But, uh, you know, I'm a drum teacher, and I work, and I, need, you know, I can't really teach drums from a boat on the move, and this obstacle, and that problem, and this obstacle, and this. And this guy said, yeah, yeah, you won't do it. And so I said, pardon me, hang on, you don't even know me. And he said, I've seen your type before, you're all mouth and no trousers, you won't do it, mate. You're talking, and I'll tell you why. Because you're putting up obstacles in front of yourself rather than seeing them as problems to overcome. And the light clicked on in my head. I thought, he's absolutely right. And then he, he said, you know, for example, you park your canal boat at a bridge. At those bridges, there's usually a place to park your car. You walk back to get your car, you drive it up to the bridge. But by the time I've said that, you're going to have created another obstacle. So what is it? The question is, you've got to ask yourself what it is you truly want. And hats off to the guy, he's 100% right, and I'm a hypocrite because I tell my drum students every day, um, don't put up problems in front of yourself, they're, they're to be overcome, you know, they're obstacles to be overcome. But perhaps it's just part of being human to say, oh, well, I can't do this because of that. I always, another thing I always say to my drum students is, you're not allowed to use can't in a drum lesson. It's a word that nearly almost never needs to be used, because I could say I can't fly to the moon in the next five seconds. Well, obviously, but then again, that's hardly worth mentioning, is it? I can't do this drum beat is not true. Of course you can. You just can't do it yet. So therefore, if you always have to add yet to something, you're kind of wasting your time in the, because in that time you said that, you could have actually been trying to get it. This is why I say to people who complain about paying their mortgage and perhaps their job, and I say, well, why don't you come live on the canal? And they say, oh, no, you know, it's not the life for me. Well, then, with all due respect, stop complaining. Because I'm sure I could probably say, well, why don't you move to an eco-dome in California or an earth ship or something else? And they say, oh, no, no, I like my tree creature comforts. Well, then, with all due respect, you prefer your creature comforts and your slavery than freedom and no toaster. It's not to say that this life, once again, is for everyone, but for those who have the sorts of values that we have in the zeitgeist movement, I would say that it's a very decent way of living. If you're not fortunate enough to um, have the funds to enable you to be able to get um, a large boat like the sort I have, um, then the narrow boats are really, really comfortable. In fact, Myself and my girlfriend saw one online the, just the other day that was about 29,000, 25,000. And I seriously offered up the idea of downsizing to something that could fit through all of the canal system here in the UK because my boat's too wide to fit north of Birmingham. But then who wants to go north of Birmingham, eh? Just kidding, just kidding. A um, little bit of uh, the north-south divide rivalry there for you here in the UK because uh, clearly human beings north of Birmingham are very different to the ones in the south. <laughs> so um, anyway, they don't have to come in at that sort of price range. I've got a couple of friends that bought them for under 20 grand, some 15. I've even heard some people buy very small ones for 10. Really depends on how far you want to take it. But obviously, it's much easier to muster up uh, that sort of money than it is the sort of money for a two-bedroom flat in uh, Watford or something, which is just stupid at the moment. It's about 180000 or something ridiculous, you know, that you that you just probably never pay off um, outside of the interest payments. So, it, I, for me, it's a no-brainer, but uh, it's easy for me to say because I've done it. And until you take the plunge and do it yourself, then you, you can't really know. And, and that's another important thing to mention as well. No matter how much advice you seek, there will always be something that you overlooked by coming on uh, to the water and that you will have to learn by doing. 
so you'll need to call on your reserves of ingenuity to solve a few problems as you go. For instance, we have single glazing here on our canal boat, and rather than pay the astronomical amount it would have cost to get double glazing, we just got some wooden panels and uh, made them the size of the windows or slightly smaller, stuck carpet to one side and push them into the windows um, when we go to bed at night and that helps to keep the boat nice and toasty. As well as the wonderful science and technology that we have sitting on top of our stove that I'm looking at right now in the shape of an eco fan. These things are basically a metal fan that's heated by the stove, eventually heating up the air vents at the top of it and creating a thermal convection system that blows the fan round and pushes heat to the other end of the boat. So um, that's really cool because otherwise the heat would just stop four or five feet in front of the stove, but this blows it all the way down the other end of the boat. Uh, that and the fact of um, can, uh, you can use candle heaters for smaller rooms. Um, I don't know if you've heard of these, but this is a good way to give the finger to the energy companies, at least in a lo-fi way. This isn't, of course, what the Zeitgeist Movement advocates at all, but in a lo-fi sense, the candle heater is both a good way to um, uh, heat a small room as well as give a nice middle finger gesture to the energy companies who have just hiked up their prices again here in the UK. So... Where a candle heater works is you take a cake tin, you put four tea lights, tea light candles in the cake tin, you put a plant pot, a terracotta pot over the top with a hole, you cover the hole with a previous tea light and then you cover that with a bigger uh, terracotta po pot with the hole open and the heat rising um, creates a convection system that heats the size of a small room for uh, approximately 8p a day if you get your candle lights from Ikea which costs you a pound for a hundred so you can see videos on on that on YouTube and um, and that has in fact gone viral that particular video for no surprising reason uh, the prices go up and suddenly everybody thinks uh, tries to think of a, a new alternative way to do things much in, in how the zeitgeist movement and the idea of a resource-based economy is a, essentially a reaction to um, the accumulation of knowledge over time and the reaction to a system that clearly doesn't work for the majority of its participants. But the shifting from one life and into the new isn't the only thing that's kept me absent from the airways of TZM Global. I have also been busy preparing an 8 series presentation which should be available soon and which I have an introduction presentation um, to and I would like to play that for you now. So here you go folks. Hello and welcome to the introduction to this eight-part presentation from the Zeitgeist Movement, or TZM for short, entitled From Social Symptom to Root Cause. My name is James Phillips. I'm a member of the UK lecture team, rotating host of the Movement's global radio show and co-global coordinator of our school's project, TZM Education, all of which are an effort to get the Movement's materials out to the general public. So what is the Zeitgeist Movement exactly? The movement is a global sustainability advocacy organisation whose principal focus is the recognition that the majority of social problems that plague the human species at this time is not the sole result of some institutional corruption, absolute scarcity, inadequate political policy, a lack of moral fibre, a flaw of human nature or some other commonly held assumption of causality but rather that issues such as poverty, corruption, pollution, homelessness, war, starvation and alike are symptoms born out of our current outdated social structure and practices. The defining goal of the movement in addressing these issues is the advocation of a new socio-economic model based upon technically responsible resource management, allocation and design to meet the needs of every human being on earth. This could be referred to as a Natural Law Resource-Based Economy, or NLRBE for short. 
This collaborative approach to social and environmental concern would look to address the root cause of social and environmental problems by arriving at decisions through using the best decision-making method we have ever come to know of as a species and the only one that has been shown to be able to consistently help people from different backgrounds and cultures to reach some form of agreement, but has as yet never been applied to our social system holistically, that being the scientific method. To sum it up in a phrase, it would be the application of the scientific method for human concern. The word zeitgeist itself refers to the cultural, moral and spiritual climate of an age or era, and movement denotes emergence or change. Therefore, we advocate a move away from the current outdated values and practices that perpetuate the current socio-economic system to a more sustainable value set based on our most up-to-date understandings of natural law via the use of the scientific method rather than money, religion, philosophy, business or politics. The first step in initiating this shift has to be an educational one, as the integrity of any system is only as good as the people who support its perpetuation through their values or information to which they are exposed. So why do I think this makes enough sense to warrant putting in all this effort and why does this message resonate with me so much and compel me to action? Well because something simply didn't seem to add up in the world for me when I was growing up and none of the mentors, leaders, institutions or philosophies said to have the answer to these problems seemed to make much sense to me, let alone making significant headway in solving these issues. I found it difficult then, as I do now, to accept that the majority of humanity have to live in abject poverty at the expense of a few, because that's the way it's always been, and that we will never live in a world without war and poverty, because it is simply our human nature to dominate and seek to control one another. Because surely, if this were really the case, then why isn't everyone like that? Is it fair to judge people as naturally greedy when the rules of the game they are surrounded by and forced to play seem to reward greedy behaviour? Just because these are potentially hard problems to solve or problems we have not solved yet does not make them unsolvable, it just makes them unsolved. I also could not understand why I had to do something on the basis of no evidence or logical reasoning simply because a supposed authority figure, who seemed to be in lockstep with this rather odd status quo, told me I have to. So I grew up a somewhat disillusioned and bewildered young man to say the least, and even though I was rather rebellious and noisy about this all at times, I had to admit that despite my many frustrations with this state of affairs, I didn't have a better idea. Put up or shut up, as the saying goes. With this sort of outlook, it should come as no surprise that I found myself watching a documentary called Zeitgeist in 2007 which was suggested to me by a fellow socially maladjusted friend. It helped to make a lot of sense about why things were this way but seemed short on solutions to me. I then went on to watch Zeitgeist Addendum in 2008 and despite an initial eureka moment after the introduction to the Venus Project's vision of how the future could be in the film, I attempted to maintain a sober head and spent the next two years trying to find holes in the idea of the NLRBE. On March 16th, 2010, at Z-Day London, upon seeing the vast cross-section of society represented in the room that day, and unable to find any logical reason or evidence-based argument against the idea, it became clear that it was time for me to put up rather than shut up. And I'm pretty damn hard to shut up when I get going. So, since then I've been going into schools to talk to kids about this idea, hosting radio shows, going out on the street to talk to the public, and putting on events to help spread this idea of a new positive direction in which we could head. So why am I now doing this presentation series? Well, one of the events I helped put on was Z-Day 2013 in London in which we featured only exterior organisations, each of whom seek to address a particular social or environmental issue closely aligned with the movement's materials. The reason for this approach was twofold. Firstly, to work with and showcase the great work being done by these organisations in their efforts to shift the cultural zeitgeist in a more positive direction. 
and secondly, to underscore the importance of a long-term aim to address the underlying causality binding these symptomatic issues together with an entirely new socio-economic model designed to solve the root cause of these interconnected issues. These points were outlined in my presentation at Z-Day 2013, entitled Joining the Dots, Drawing a Picture of Transition, which you can find in the description for this video, which I'd recommend viewing prior to this series, as it should help to give a better understanding of the aim of this series. I continued this spirit of unity set forth at Z-Day by setting up a series of monthly events with each organisation represented that day throughout the following year. For each event, I prepared a presentation through the prism of the issue in question to highlight the need to have a long-term goal in mind to address the root cause of their chosen issue, as well as the many other vast, varied and interconnected problems we now face. There is certainly no shortage of well-intentioned social humanitarian activist groups and charities attempting to address them, that's for sure. However, despite their admirable intentions, they are either unaware of, do not mention or do not appreciate the connections between these problems and the need to shift to a new model designed to address the reason for the existence of the problem they are trying to solve. Sadly, this is to unwittingly perpetuate these problems rather than solve them and adds up to little more than patchwork, unfortunately. But if these groups who clearly care enough to act could appreciate this point enough to perhaps advocate the NLRBE as a long-term goal, whilst promoting their causes as an important stepping stone in the journey of transition to this objective, then this would be a massive step in the right direction. This is the purpose of this series to highlight the need to move from addressing social symptoms to root cause and working together to do so. Each presentation will include a link to the featured organisation's presentation on Z-Day to help provide some background information and context for each presentation as well as extensive sources to the presented materials. This series will also be made available in audio format through the Movement's Global Radio Show, which can be accessed through our website at www.thezeitgeistmovement.com. There will be some repetition of certain information throughout the eight presentations, as there is no need to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, when making a particular point. Hopefully these slides should help to provide revision of some of the key points, while serving to give context and meaning to the point being made at the time. It should be stated that the movement holds no allegiance to, nor agrees with any of the featured organisations' points of view explicitly. Rather, the purpose here is to use these perspectives to help illuminate the need to shift our values into alignment with our most up-to-date understandings of the natural world, thus increasing our overall adaptability and hence evolutionary fitness. Because for a long time now, the world's religious leaders, philosophers and writers have been proposing notions of how the world can become a more peaceful, happy and joyful place in which for us all to live. But the ability to technically achieve the abundance required for such a globally collaborative system was never a reality until now. We've achieved so much as a species and to our knowledge are the greatest evolutionary success story this universe has ever created. Quite simply, we are amazing, and together there is nothing we can't do. We've changed before, and we can do it again, but not without effort. So I'm afraid the first change has to start with you, not someone else. For in the final analysis, we are one people, and we share one planet. So there you go folks um, this series is both going to be available through the movements global YouTube channel as well as through this radio show in uh, eight installments which will just go out played with with no intro no outro just as a lecture in its own right for eight weeks running straight during the summer I think the, the benefit of that and not having a blurb on the front or the end 
is that then it's archived as almost an audio book format so you can just go back and listen to any lecture you you choose um, so I think that's going to be really cool and the source notes will be added in the description for each YouTube video as well as each blog talk radio show as well the next thing on my hit list to do for the movement is the update to the TZM Education website which will involve a global movement activism project to get into at least one school. I, I've been through this topic before and I gave a presentation at London Z Day on that which will be included in the show that launches that particular project. So more on that um, hopefully in a couple of months. I also have completed the reading of The First Civilization, which will be made available as an audiobook in the near future once it's just compiled, which uh, shouldn't take too long. And so returning to the topic of canal life, I'm well aware that we can't all just move on to the canals and um, sing Kumbaya and live happily ever after. It isn't what the movement advocates. No matter how much you may want to uh, escape what is really a massive waste machine of inefficiency and inequality, you are never going to be completely gone from it. Um, it brings up something that was said by a gentleman who turned up to Z Day 2011 in London and um, had a conversation with myself and Peter in which he said that he'd been travelling the world with a backpack on his back and nothing else because he didn't want to be a part of this system anymore. And he turned up to a little hut in Africa, in the middle of nowhere, picked up a what seemed like a innocuous glass full of coffee, and to turn it up, he saw the word Nestle and realised that there is nowhere to hide. So, the canal life certainly isn't um, a hideaway it's a vehicle that's going to allow me to spend my life advocating something that makes sense rather than contributing to something that does not but in the meantime we must limit our dependency on this system and I can think of no better way in doing so and spending my days on this planet than being a boatman see you soon everyone